We, uh, we are very pleased to be here and pleased to be trying to shed some uh, understandable light on this whole area of quantum, and in particular, uh, some of the things that are happening in quantum hardware and software. We hear a lot about quantum computers, uh, which, uh, as many people have said, is five year, has been five years away for the last 25 years. Uh, but I think we're finally at a place where it truly will happen in the next few years. Uh, and, and we'll hear about that. But you also hear about quantum communications. Uh, the Chinese are using entanglement. Now, entanglement is uh, what Einstein called spooky action at a distance. If you take two particles and you do certain things to, quote, entangle them, and then you separate them by thousands of miles or millions of miles or across the universe, when you change one of them, the other one instantaneously changes. So it is communications uh, at, at not the speed of light, but at instantaneous communication and unbreakable. And at this point, the Chinese have been communicating with satellites uh, 1,200 miles above the Earth using entangled quantum communications. And finally, for the last number of years, we've had what are called SQUID, uh, superconducting quantum interference devices to measure very weak magnetic fields and very accurately. So the quantum world, which was launched more or less 100 years ago, uh, and uh, with, a, with a lot of skepticism from many people, you know, Einstein hated quantum uh, theory. He said, God doesn't play dice. But in fact, God does play dice. Uh, probabilities are, are what quantum is all about. And it's taken 100 years to figure out how to utilize it in ways that are very practical. And so our panel here gives us three different views uh, of, of things that are happening. And I'd like to start uh, with, with Nicholas, because the, the overarching question here is, is quantum computing real, and when will it be real? And there have been many different approaches taken to quantum computing uh, and building things there. IBM, in particular, has built a really great uh, infrastructure and communi community in quantum, an ecosystem of several hundred companies that they get together several times a year to talk about quantum software, quantum networking, putting quantum on the cloud, all sorts of things. And then, of course, their own quantum computers. But their own quantum computers, it's hard to solve interesting problems at this point. We need to get much more. And so I'd like to introduce Nick, Nicholas Farina. And for full disclosure, my firm, B Capital, is an investor in his company. Uh, and we looked at a lot of quantum computing companies before we decided that this one actually had a chance to change the world. Nicholas. Thank you, Howard, and, and uh, thank you for um, uh, allowing me to speak here today. Uh, so the first thing that I'd like to address is what, what is quantum computing uh, in, in a few sentences. And quantum computing, uh, one thing that I like to emphasize is that to build quantum computers requires a great knowledge of, of mathematics and, and physics. But to actually understand what they are is relatively simple. Uh, it's the next generation of high performance uh, supercomputing. Uh, so quantum computers are going to unlock major breakthroughs in areas like drug discovery, uh, material science, um, and um, finance, uh, perhaps. Um, a lot of these applications are already known. And this is something that I'd like to underscore, is right now the world is waiting uh, for a quantum computer that has a large enough scale and power to solve problems. But when people ask about the applications, which will be covered in the next panel, but I'll uh, discuss briefly, the applications in many ways are already here. Um, so companies uh, and uh, academic labs already know what to do with quantum computers. They just need a quantum computer that has a large enough scale. So what we do um, at AeroQ, I'll describe briefly, uh, there's, uh, depending on who you ask, uh, about seven to 10 different ways to build a quantum computer. And all of these ways are very different. So you have methods like superconducting circuits, which IBM is Google, um, our AWS are pursuing. Uh, 
trapped ions like ion Q um, and Honeywell are pursuing. And what we do at AeroQ is we use electrons on helium. And this sounds very exotic, uh, but in fact, um, it is one of the best understood systems in nature. Uh, so to describe it quickly, um, our approach is scale first. Uh, we began thinking about building a quantum computer from the perspective of scale. So we start our system by using a standard CMOS fabricated chip um, that we have already produced and uh, we have created the largest demonstration of scale of any quantum computing company um, with 2,432 electrons. And then the really fun part is that above the CMOS chip, uh, when you cool down helium, which is a gas at, at room temperature, when you cool it down to the temperature of outer space, it actually becomes a, a liquid, in particular a superfluid. Um, and superfluids can do amazing things like climb, uh, climb walls. Um, and so well, then we trap electrons above this layer of liquid helium, and these electrons form our qubits. Um, and the electrons are attracted to their own image uh, beneath the surface of the liquid helium. And all of this is happening uh, at a chip the size of your thumbnail. Uh, so in short, you know, we believe that you uh, need to start with scale, and to do so you need to build quantum computers uh, using standard fabrication that we have today, and that's what we do. So, um, where are we with quantum computing? Uh, there is a, a very funny joke that uh, quantum computing has been five years away uh, for the last 20 years. Um, <laughs> and I, I think now, um, I've been in the field now for eight years. Uh, my distinguished colleagues have been uh, in it for much longer. Um, and it has been amazing to see the rate of progress um, and one thing that I'll note is that to get to quantum usefulness, where we're using quantum computers to solve real-world commercial problems, it's not only building computers. There's three things that are creating like a snowball rolling downhill, uh, getting bigger and faster. There's error correction. Uh, there are, of course, building better processors. And then there are more efficient algorithms um, that are used to create applications. So it's happening now in quantum computing. And the reason that the time scale now truly is uh, between, let's say, three to five years now, is rapid progress is being made in all of these areas. And finally, um, all uh, investment in the area has grown rapidly from governments, uh, so many billions of dollars have been put into this field from different governments. And now almost every large company that you can think of is now involved in quantum computing. Uh, so Microsoft, Google, um, IBM, of course. Um, and all of these are available, are offer quantum computers on the cloud. So what I will conclude by saying is that Anyone who wants to use a quantum computer today can actually use a quantum computer. Uh, you, you can go onto the cloud already um, and use small quantum computers uh, via IBM, um, via Google, um, via Microsoft. Uh, and I believe that the investment that these companies have shown and the rapid progress of putting quantum computers on the cloud make them practical, accessible, and ready for use very soon. Uh, so quantum computing is here, uh, it's real, and uh, watch it for the next couple of years. Uh, thank you, thank you, Nick. I think you might want to say one thing or two about why qubits are so much fa can be so much faster and sort of the parallel operation relative to standard computers. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, so uh, qubits uh, are the building blocks of quantum computers. So in a classical computer, uh, every com type of uh, computer that we know today, 
uh, from your cell phone to uh, a high performance computer, information is stored um, in either zero or one. And in a quantum computer, uh, we use qubits, um, which, are, uh, which store information in a superposition uh, that is neither zero nor one. Now, a lot of times people say, you know, well, uh, it's in two places at the same time. Uh, and that's not exactly true. Uh, so that's one fact that you can take away today. Um, in, in, in fact, it's, it's more like a, a probability um, of, of which, uh, which state it's in. And then once you observe the state that it's in, um, you, it collapses. And this is called co coherence time. Um, but what allows the information to be processed uh, so much more uh, quickly um, is this concept of, of entanglement, um, which allows you to solve problems that can take um, a superposition and entanglement um, are the, the, what allow this um, exponential speed up for certain problems. And this is what allows problems that, are, that would take 10,000 years or more to do even on the world's fastest supercomputers can be done almost instantaneously uh, on the quantum computers of the future. Uh, so these concepts of superposition and entanglement um, and qubits are the foundations of quantum computing and uh, will allow us to make amazing breakthroughs. Thank you. Now I'd, I'd like to turn to, to Gabi uh, to talk about how this impacts communications and, and security and so on. Yes, thanks. Um, I would like to broad a little bit. We are talking today about quantum computing, but actually yesterday we talked about GNAI and all the applications that we have there. And these are new technologies that will allow us great innovations and to solve problems that we cannot solve today. And imagine that you have Gen AI or AI and quantum computing, quantum AI. So making problems from machine learning but on quantum hardware. So this will bring another new direction and dimensions to solve actually problems that we cannot solve today and change also our life as we heard yesterday with Gen AI. All these new technologies can of course only be used if you have trust in the technology and you have also cybersecurity. So the security landscape. On one side, we have actually two sides of the same metal. We have the optimism, we have the possibilities not seen today. On the other side, we need to develop trustworthy infrastructures, make the technology trust secure, securing our privacy and also resilience. And we see we have such a complex systems today that actually making cybersecurity, actually we need to go to cyber resilience. On cyber resilience means we cannot defend everything, but just the most important part. What are the most important part? Of course, in case you get a cyber risk management to see what are the best and the highest risks and how really to protect them. And one important part is we need to think as an ecosystem, not in isolated parts. We cannot talk about computing, distinguished from communication, distinguished from sensors, and then we have the AI community, the Gen AI community, not coming together. And the real benefit we need is um, to think holistically. And this holistic thinking in ecosystems is also the most important part uh, if you think about cybersecurity, where I came from. So the quantum security, one essential part, is really to think in a holistic way. Now, we've heard quantum computers five to 10 years. I think we had a discussion <laughs> with Howard, not the next 25 years, I don't <laughs> believe so. Um, should we think about now? Absolutely. Everybody needs to think now about using how quantum computing a roadmap because uh, the quantum encryption uh, will be uh, certainly sometimes necessary but all the data that is available can be downloaded and when the quantum computer is ready we can decrypt 
So it's important to think about Gen AI and especially country computing in a holistic way and make the roadmap, the awareness, what will happen now. And I think this is also especially important from the cybersecurity aspect, because what is the best technology if we don't trust them? Yeah. What can the best AI, gen AI, whatever gives us, and also quantum computing, if we don't trust the technology? So it's essentially to build the trust and especially also the ecosystem. Thank you. And I think one thing that, that, uh, that, that Gabi said that's really important to understand is that one of the things quantum computing is supposed to be able to do, and we have algorithms for it, is to decrypt the current standards, RSA and so on, that are used to encrypt most of our financial information and most of the information on the web. And if you don't start doing things today, then five years from now, people who have been collecting all that information, the national governments, can go back and decrypt everything you sent in this last few mm -hmm. years. And that's something that we have some, some fears about. So people are creating new methods of uh, quantum safe encryption that's not subject to those things. And they should start being used today and not only when the quantum computers are available. But now I'd like to turn to, to Stefano uh, to talk a little bit about more about some of this, including uh, what he's doing at NodeQ to help optimize all of this. Okay, thank, <clears throat> thank you very much, Howard, for, for, for this. So yes, I mean, uh, as Gabby was saying, uh, it's, I mean, well, quantum computing is good for many things like improving uh, simulation, drug discovery, uh, financial simulations, uh, and chemistry, and many other things. It has this threat to our current cybersecurity infrastructure. So uh, because of, as, as Howard was saying, I mean, a quantum computer can actually uh, break uh, RSA, current public key crypto systems. So what we have to do today and act now is to start migrating uh, our uh, networks, communication networks, computer networks, into the new, you know, the new standards, okay? So something which is uh, resistant to quantum computers, which is something that already in the US is starting this year with, with, the, with the Biden's Act. So, and there are different solutions. So there's a post-quantum cryptography, which is exactly I mean, this, this uh, uh, new type of technology, new type of cryptography based on problems which are resistant to both classical and quantum attacks, and so on. So in Anoq, we, we, we deal with this, so we basically build this kind of software infrastructure for, for networks, but also we, we make like a step forward because we say, okay, well, I mean, these new types of technology, these new types of crypto systems, uh, well, they are more demanding, okay? So they are more involved. So there is like, a, uh, you know, longer keys, uh, uh, more difficult and, and uh, you know, time-consuming encryption systems, a decryption system. As you can imagine, you need to, you know, uh, to be uh, resistant to, you know, to classical quantum computers. So it's more difficult. And that uh, is, uh, creates uh, another thing for, for current infrastructure, not just about security, but also network performance. So when you start to migrate our networks into the new protocols, which are okay, secure to quantum computers, so these protocols are, are uh, demanding and the, the performance can slow down. So for example, I don't know, uh, you can want to send a file from point A to point B and it may take a longer time, even much longer time. So one important point is network optimization. So we need to not just make the, the network secure, but also optimize them in such a way that they are really use, usable okay, in the future. So I want to have like my uh, point A and point B communicating, but at the same time, I also have my point C and point T communicating and so on. So when you think about the network, it's a very complex structure. And when you start to, to introduce a very, a very small delay in, in one of these communications, so there's a kind of a butterfly effect, so that the network becomes easily congested and so on. So you really need a smart, uh, orchestration of this new uh, infrastructure. And uh, this is a very important point that we are uh, dealing uh, with my company, you know, Q. So uh, we're just not providing somehow, you know, this, this kind of software for uh, encryption and decryption, resistant to quantum computers, but also, let's say, the network software for making, uh, you know, these networks really, you know, uh, working, uh, uh, making them working efficiently and with good performance. So that, I mean, today, uh, 
we have, I don't know, our speed of one gigabit per second, and, and, and hopefully we have the same speed I mean, uh, in, in five years' time, but at the same time we are, I don't know, completely secure uh, with respect to this uh, new quantum computing uh, threat. Uh, that's, that's more or less basically the, uh, you know, the, the, the challenges uh, from the point of view of networks. And I mean, if, if, I were, if I want to say like a very yeah. couple, couple of minutes more about yeah. uh, networks, because you yeah, were talking about like security in networks, but also some, at some point how, um, you know, what happens to networks, to computers in the past was that, I mean, they were put together to create internet, right? So this is also something that's going to happen with quantum computers. So one, once we have built, you know, uh, larger devices, we are, you know, we have a secure infrastructure that we just talk about. It's also a matter of, you know, connecting together a quantum computers in such a way to create quantum internet. A quantum meter is a very cool idea. It's a very, like, if you think about it, like kind of a distributed quantum computing environment, where, I mean, the powerful of quantum computer can be scaled up even more. And, and, uh, and in, a, in a quantum internet, uh, clearly, which is, uh, you know, in the, you know, in the roadmaps of many uh, research projects and, I mean, companies and so on, there are many challenges that, I mean, we still need to, uh, uh, need to overcome. But it's, 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 it's an amazing idea, and hopefully, uh, you know, in uh, 10, uh, 15 years, uh, uh, even more, even, even before, probably, depending on the, on the pace of the development you have now, we have, we have this kind of hybrid uh, system with the classical internet for what we do today, at the same time secure because we can, we can encrypt that, but also a quantum internet that connects quantum computers to be even more powerful for I mean, the, the, good, uh, you know, the good things they can do. I, I think that's a very, very important point. Uh, you know, because almost all of the quantum architectures require uh, very low temperatures, temperatures between zero and one degree Kelvin. Uh, they all require superconducting refrigerators and so on. So we're not likely to have one at home. You're, you're not likely to have a quantum PC. Uh, I'm sure we will eventually, but because I'm a believer in technology and solving these kinds of problems. But, but certainly for the next few decades, uh, these will all be accessible over the internet. And because they're accessible over the internet, you will need secure ways to get to them which is some of the things that, that uh, the professors have been talking about. And you'll need them to be, so they'll be on the cloud. So whether it's Azure or AWS or Google Cloud Platform or, or SAP, whatever, they'll all have quantum computers as one of the possible ways to compute. And because the quantum computers will solve very highly parallel problems, uh, including, by the way, uh, machine learning problems and large language model creation problems, you need to put huge amounts of information into them. And that means having networks that can handle very large data flows over the network. Uh, we've been talking in the, in the uh, US and in Europe about terabit networks, not just gigabit networks. So right now, our internet, for most of us at home, you're probably running a few hundred megabits per second. And maybe in, in uh, universities, you're running one to 10 gigabits per second. But would really take advantage of some of the things we want to do with quantum computing, we're going to have to get up to terabit networking. So there are more opportunities uh, as well in, in doing things of that sort. So I'd like to really, <laughs> I'd like to thank all of our panelists this morning. And I hope you've learned a little bit about quantum computing. And we're all around for the rest of the day. So if you see us uh, in the hallways or whatever, please uh, come over and ask any questions you may have. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Thank you. Thank you.